fall into ETF investing, a special edition of ETF Market Insights. I'm Erin Allen, Vice President of Online Distribution at BMO ETFs. And in just a moment, I'm going to be turning over my hosting duties to Cornell Schreiber. But before I do, a quick reminder that today's episode, we're not providing you any advice or investment recommendations. Today's show is all about providing education around the markets and around investing in ETFs for Canadian do-it-yourself investors. Cornell is the host of the Build Wealth Canada podcast, where he talks a lot about investing in personal finance topics. He's also the founder of the Canadian Financial Summit, which is an online virtual conference. Cornell, I'm going to turn it over to you. Today, we're going to talk about how to build a strong core using broad market ETFs. And we're going to be covering some best practices when it comes to deciding which index to actually use and which ETFs to use within your portfolio. And to help me with this, I have Alfred Lee from BMO ETFs. He is a portfolio manager, a director, and an investment strategist. And we have Graham McKenzie, who is the managing director of exchange traded funds over at TMX. And so guys, welcome. And let's kick things off with the first question. When it comes to broad market index ETFs, what are really the main benefits of those? Well, why don't I jump in there? The One of the really great benefits of broad market uh, index products or ETFs is that they really deliver uh, the building blocks of trying to build uh, the core of someone's portfolio. And then you can build from there. And what's great about them is they naturally provide uh, diversification uh, because they're broad, obviously, and, and they essentially encom- um, encompass the entire market with one product. With that, therefore, you get low costs because of not only economy as a scale, but they're easier, I, I don't want to say they're easier to manage necessarily, but they require uh, particularly less cost than say an actively managed fund. So you get the benefit of diversification, you get the benefit of uh, costs. And that really, from there, you're able to start to build your portfolio. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Did you have anything to add, Alfred, or do you think that covers it pretty well? I think he covered a lot of it. I think, um, you know, ETFs, represent a lot of uh, efficiencies in the market. So as, as Graham mentioned, uh, covering the entire market, but also their ease of access and, and low management fees as well, which is what really made ETS really popular over the last 10 to 15 years. Mm-hmm. Now, yeah, we've seen a lot of growth in these core ETFs, especially over the pandemic. Why do you guys think that is? Well, I think um, due to a number of different factors, I think um, you know, time, for example, if you recall during the lockdowns, we, ha- we had a lot of time on our hands. I think a lot of people took on a lot of interest uh, whether it was baking or fitness, but I think in, investing was a, one of them, right? So we all heard about the uh, the Reddit army or, you know, just a lot of the growth in the do-it-yourself investor. So uh, I think a lot of people had a lot of time on their hands, but in addition to that, a lot more disposable income as well, right? So when I think back during the uh, pandemic, I wasn't really spending on much. I was spending on, you know, the occasional trip to the grocery store, uh, maybe on, on a few Amazon purchases, but a lot of of people had disposable income. So whether it was you know, that uh, lack of spending, but also due to the emergency response benefits, uh, a lot of people had more disposable income. So I thought they were allocating it to the market. Uh, in addition to that, I think the market really bounced back really quickly when the government put stimulus, uh, the central bank put a lot of monetary stimulus as well. So the market bounced back and a lot of people you know, took notice. There was that fear of missing out. And when it came to ETFs, as Graham mentioned, all the benefits of ETFs, uh, a lot of people saw those efficiencies. But even when it came to a lot of the seasoned investors, I thought, um, they identified that you know during March and April of 2020, when liquidity dried up, a lot of their traditional investment vehicles didn't have that liquidity. So whereas the ETF continued to trade, they really were attracted to you know the benefits of ETFs in general. Um, but what we find is during you know, major market sell-offs in the last 10 to 15 years, 2008 being a good example, uh, 2020 being another good example as well, as Graham could probably attest to, during market sell-offs, there's an increase in volume and there's an increase in assets going into ETFs just because of those efficiencies that we've talked about. Mm. Gotcha. Anything to add on your end, Graham? No, I, I think I think Alfred really summed it up well. I think there was an excess amount of capital and money available at the time, and I think there's been a lot a lot of conversation, both from from in the media and the press, as well as in from a regulatory perspective about costs. 
of making investments. And I think that resonated with a lot of people in ETFs essentially were, were our vehicle that people were able to save investment dollars and put them to work through that through an ETF vehicle. So I think that in itself also is why people chose ETFs over other, other investment vehicles. And I think another point is that um, for an ETF, during those market sell-offs, people don't necessarily want to pick individual stocks. What they know is you know, they want exposure to the market, and this is the best way of getting it through an ETF, cost-efficient, liquid. Um, so it's not necessarily about stock picking, but it's just that the market is undervalued at this point. Uh, what's the most efficient way of getting into the market? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. And broad market ETFs, obviously, they track an index. And I think a lot of the viewers today are probably familiar with a lot of the main index providers like the S&P, the FTSE, the MSCI. How is that relevant? Why is it important which index is actually being tracked within these core ETFs? Well, I think it, it, it's important to recognize that uh, the index that, that an ETF tracks really does matter in a sense that um, you want to be comfortable and, and assured that the ETF that you buy is actually replicating or tracking what you're expecting it to. And so therefore you really need to pay attention to that because two ETFs that are tracking you know, a similar market but have two different indices following will potentially have two different outcomes. So it's important to understand the methodology and the uh, parameters that are put behind an index uh, while choosing a product. Mm -hmm. And while that sounds um, challenging, uh, it, it, is, it is fairly laid out there and, and a lot of the larger index providers do provide information and, and, and you'll find that on websites and, and everywhere where you get some sense of, okay, this is actually gonna do what it does. And, and an index provider, what they can provide and help is the experience that they have in the sense that if they're, um, you know, before they come to market, they've been back tested or they have the experience of knowing it, then they know how to manage corporate events because everything from M&A activity that a company does, uh, dividends, buybacks, all these corporate activities that happen translate into the, the index weightings. And if they can't manage that in an efficient manner, or it's challenging for the ETF provider to replicate or follow, then tracking error happens. So there is a lot of advantages to who the index provider could be or is. Mm -hmm. I, I think in addition to that, I think um, you know, reputation is definitely very important in terms of the index provider. Uh, but on top of that, I think to a retail investor or a do-it-yourself investor, it doesn't really matter you know, which index we track on the surface. Right, as long as it, it provides exposure to that asset class. Uh, the benefit, however, is that when you track these name brand indexes, a lot of institutions are benchmarked to these indexes, right? So uh, because it attracts you know, institutional users in a various degree or a, a, you know, a broader, uh, you know, a different amount of, of investors, it does enhance the liquidity of that ETF. So you know, because we attract institutional investors on certain indexes, family office or, or whatever it may be, there's more people using that ETF and it does enhance the liquidity of that ETF. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. And now you're from BMO and BMO has a whole suite of these broad market ETFs. Can you talk about some of them? Sure, so we do have a, a number of core ETFs. So um, before I get into that, why don't I just talk about you know, what those cores are? Sure. So uh, the core ETFs are basically what I view as you know, the major building blocks in your portfolio. Um, so those would be Canadian equities, U.S. equities, international equities, emerging market equities, and also uh, Canadian bonds as well. So um, I think when you're putting together a portfolio, these are the you know, necessary building blocks when it comes to you know, constructing a portfolio. Um, I think when you look at how portfolios are built now compared to even 10 years ago, 10 years ago, people looked at diversification and it was you know, 20 to 30 stocks, and that was properly diversified. But I think what a lot of people realized is that during, you know, especially market sell-offs, these stocks could be really correlated, right? So a lot of investors are now focusing more so on, you know, not just diversification within an asset class, but also diversification across asset classes as well. So, you know, ETFs provide that. They provide, you know, total exposure to a market, as Graham mentioned. Uh, but they also provide exposure to those building blocks, right? So there's an ETF that track all those necessary, 
necessarily uh, you know, building blocks that I mentioned in all those core asset classes. And through that, investors can properly construct you know, well-diversified portfolio. Gotcha. And how does the broad market ETF approach compare to some of the other investing approaches that we see? Uh, that's a good question. I think, you know, um, with you compared to active management, for example, uh, I think active management gets a lot of attention just in terms of like a lot of investors are always concerned about, you know, what stocks am I buying? You know, what, when should I buy these stocks? So mar- um, security selection and uh, market timing, I find, gets a lot of attention. But when you look at historically how passive investments have performed versus active investment vehicles or active managers, very few active managers have outperformed the index over the long haul. So uh, take U.S. large cap equity managers as an example. Very few of them have outperformed the S&P 500 over time. So the S&P, so the Standard & Poor's, uh, they put together a monthly report called the SPIVA report, which stands for the S&P uh, Index versus Active. So it's a very interesting report. So I took a look at uh, the most recent report this morning, and 90% of active managers underperformed the S&P 500 when it came to large cap U.S. equities. But that's not um, you know, atypical of, of this month. That's pretty consistent across all time frames. And it's also pretty consistent across you know, different asset classes as well, whether it's mid cap, uh, small caps, even bonds and other jurisdictions as well when it comes to Canadian equities. Um, so again, I think a lot of fanfare goes into active management, but you know, the proper way of constructing a portfolio from my point of view is, you know, focusing on those building blocks as I mentioned and using ETFs to get those, you know, passive exposures. Hmm. Graham, any thoughts? No, I, th- I think it's, it's important when someone's trying to build you know, their portfolio and looking at building their core, I think it's it's a really relevant point in that comes out of the SPIVA reports. There's no doubt mm-hmm. that if you're looking for market returns, uh, there's other potential ways that you can essentially add alpha to your portfolio or enhance it instead of instead of when you're dealing with core, you really got to look at market returns and get that exposure in that diversity and that take advantage of the cost advantage. That's right. When you're doing the broad market index investing, what are some of the key considerations that you think investors should factor in when they're deciding and constructing their portfolio? Well, I think some of the things that, that people need to be thinking about is uh, obviously their, their weightings. Uh, Alfred had sort of mentioned uh, some of the core areas that, that are used to build um, the foundation of one's portfolio. But there's also um, home bias. Canadians tend to be more invested in North American securities uh, just because that's what we know, whereas there's a whole world in, in, in further diversification that's available from that perspective in time horizon, risk tolerances. Alfred, yeah, want to elaborate I, on that? Or? Yeah, I think those are all good points. I think you know, home bias is one that really matters a lot to Canadian investors. So you know, when you look at the Canadian market, uh, it's really made up of you know, three sectors, finance, energy and material. Uh, sometimes it makes up over 70% of the market. That's just the nature of our economy. So you know, when you look at these sectors, they are highly cyclical, meaning that when the economy is performing well, these sectors tend to perform well. But when the economy contracts, you know, there's not a whole lot of defensive exposure of the Canadian equity market, right? So um, going beyond Canada, I think, allows investors to get diversification, not just from a country level, but just also from a sector level as well. But um, I think another consideration that investors have to think about is when they go outside of Canada, there's also the currency exposure as well, right? So, um, you know, when you invest in Canada, the only thing they have to worry about is the performance of the underlying securities. But when they go outside of Canada, they also have to consider, you know, the impact of the currency versus the Canadian dollar as well. Uh, the good thing to Canadian investors is that through the innovation of the ETF market, there's also currency hedged ETFs as well. So these currency hedged ETFs, I think, are great tools for investors because not only does it allow investors to have exposure to uh, the broad market index, but it also allows investors to hedge out that potential currency risk as well. Mm-hmm. What about investors who want to allocate some money outside of broad market ETFs? So maybe there are certain you know, sectors or themes that they want to tilt towards, maybe you know, clean energy, robotics, for example. How can someone have both a part of their portfolio in broad market total index funds and another part that's also 
sort of satellite approaches? Well, I think, I mean, the fact that, that we, we're, we've been talking about these broad market uh, ETFs and really what they are, and we've defined them as, and in, in what they're defined generally as, is core. And that's, that's essentially what purpose they're solving. Then you can add on to that in, in manners in which to either further add diversification, uh, create non-correlated returns with other asset classes, or essentially look at um, some of the sectors or themes that you just mentioned as ways to enhance performance. And so really what that, that tends to be referred to is, is sort of a core satellite approach uh, to one's portfolio. So you build the core, that foundation of that portfolio, and then on the outside of that, you start to build satellites um, that represent all kinds of different uh, either themes, sectors, asset classes, and manners in which you can reduce risk and look to essentially uh, enhance the performance of the portfolio. And maybe this is where, for some, this would be where they would potentially add an active active mandate to the portfolio um, that, that Alfred was, was pointing out earlier that perhaps doesn't necessarily always fit in building someone's core of their portfolio. So. Did you have anything to add to that one, Alfred? Yeah, I think, you know, of course, Adelaide, I think that is, uh, when you look at it, it's a very structured way of, you know, outperforming the market. So, you know, if you allocate, let's say, you know, 70 or 80 percent or whatever you choose to an index and then the remaining percentage to, you know, a thematic ETF or a sector based ETF or even individual stocks, that it's a more structured way of taking a small part of your portfolio and risking that in order to potentially outperform the market. So. We see a lot of institutions that actually do that, so it's a very effective strategy, and I think it's a very you know solid way of building a portfolio. Mm, gotcha. How can an investor who is new to all this and would like to build a portfolio of core ETFs, how can they do that when they don't even really know how to build a portfolio yet? Yeah, it's a great question. I think you know when you look at asset allocation, uh, what a lot of investors may not know is asset allocation is actually the most critical decision that investors have to make. So academic studies have actually shown that asset allocation determines you know, the major uh, determinant of risk and return in your portfolio. When it comes to market timing and security selection, it actually means very little compared to asset allocation. So the bigger question is, you know, how do you do that on your own? Uh, the good thing is that you know, in the ETF world, there are kind of pre-made asset allocation ETFs for investors. Um, so we have a number of asset allocation ETFs, for example, that are based on various risk profiles, all the way from conservative, all the way up to um, an all equity portfolio. So the beauty of these ETFs is that it's made up of six to nine different ETFs. So it gets you exposure to not just Canadian equities, international equities, but also bonds as well. Um, but the good thing is that they're professionally managed as well, and rebalanced on a regular basis. But the other good thing is that the management, management fee of 20 basis points that's the only fee you pay. So you don't pay the fee on the underlying ETFs in addition to that. Um, so it's a very effective way of uh, building a portfolio. There's um, a couple of ways of using them. Mm -hmm. So you know you could hold that in your uh, portfolio as the only holding. Uh, but in addition to that, you could also, as Graham mentioned, you could use that in a core satellite strategy where you combine you know, one of these asset allocation ETFs and then you sprinkle in you know, whether it's single securities, an active mutual fund, or either you know, sector or thematic based ETFs on top of that as well. So very practical solutions, um, especially for a lot of investors that are new to investing and don't have the time or resources or the know-how of putting together a proper portfolio. Mm, gotcha. Well, guys, thank you so much for your expertise. It's really, I think, great information, especially for investors who are new to all of this and they want to figure out, okay, how can we actually implement some of this? What are some of the key considerations when we're trying to build a portfolio? Uh, so really a big thanks uh, to you guys for coming on, sharing your expertise, uh, and a big thanks to, to, to BMO ETFs as well for putting on these free sessions for DIY investors. They're a huge help. And uh, again, guys, thank you so much for coming. Thank you to BMO ETFs, and we hope to see you next time. Take care. Jessica Morehouse is the host of the More Money podcast, where she tackles personal finance and investing topics. She's also an accredited financial counselor and a personal finance expert. So now I'm going to turn it over to you, Jessica.
Hello, I'm joined today by Paul from MSCI. Paul is Executive Director and Head of Wealth Indexed Investments. MSCI is a leading provider of indexes and a leader in ESG research. I'm also joined by Rosa Van Den Beemt from BMO GAM. Rosa is Vice President of Stewardship Responsible Investment at BMO Global Asset Management. And Rosa is also a corporate engagement practitioner with 10 years experience in the responsible investment industry and joined BMO GAM's responsible investment team in early 2020. Rosa specializes in North American corporate governance and engaging management and board members on ESG. Now, during today's session, we're going to be discussing ESG investing and how it can help manage risk in your portfolio, along with how ESG ratings and indexes are constructed. We will also look at the other side of the responsible investment coin, active ownership and engagement, and learn more about how that is an important consideration. So let's start with you, Paul. Thanks so much for being here. Um, let's start the conversation with kind of an important question. What is ESG investing? Yeah, well, let me start by thanking you for having me, Jessica, and our partners, obviously, at BMO GAM. Um, so I'll give you the simple answer first and then maybe walk through some of the history of the industry. So simply put, ESG investing is the application of environmental, social, and governance lenses to an investment process in addition to all of the financial metrics that people tend to care about. Now, what I do want to be careful about is to make sure that it's not a measure of corporate goodness, mm. for lack of a better term, but more of a measure of corporate resiliency to environmental, social, and governance risks. And I think that's a common misperception. And if we think about the evolution of the industry and where we started, there's a couple of different subtypes of ESG investing. The first is socially responsible investing, or what some people would allude to today as values investing. And it's essentially the elimination of things that investors find objectionable. So years ago, it was tobacco, alcohol, firearms. Today, potentially more energy related. Um, but that's really the generation one approach. Mm -hmm. A more modern approach is what's referred to as ESG integration, where it's less purely about the elimination of things and more about positive inclusion of highly rated companies, regardless of what industry Mm -hmm. they're in. The third subcategory would be what I would call um, either single pillar ESG investing, some people call it impact investing, but it's nichier. It's got a very narrow focus. Some examples would be women's leadership is a very popular style of, uh, of investing. Green buildings is, has gotten pretty popular. And then the fourth subcategory, what we at MSCI believe is really a standalone category is climate investing. Due to the progress made at the Paris Accord seven years ago and COP21 and all the frameworks that were created after that, this has become a distinct field of investing where investors seek to only own investments that are aligned with a one and a half to two degree warming scenario. Mm -hmm. Okay, now can you provide a general update or overview of the ESG ETF market in Canada? So at the moment, the ESG ETF market is roughly $10 billion in AUM spread across 130 products. And so for those listeners that are interested in learning more, um, BMO Wealth Management has some excellent research out there. They've written extensively on, uh, on the ecosystem that's available. It represents about 3.5% of total ETF AUM, but it's growing rapidly. Mm -hmm. If we were having this conversation three years ago, it would have been about $2 billion in AUM and about 30 or 40 products. And I guess in, in my opinion, 2019 and 2020 were incredibly important years for the ecosystem. And that's mostly because large ETF sponsors launched full suites of ESG ETFs. And so it all of a sudden became possible that the listeners could build a fully globally diversified ESG portfolio inclusive of equity and fixed income, mm -hmm. whereas that was not the case previously. Now, what is the difference between an indexed based ESG solution and an actively managed ESG solution? So the, the major difference I would characterize is human judgment 
versus a transparent rules-based mm -hmm. approach. And so let me elaborate on that a little more. An active portfolio manager often has all of the tools available to them that are used in the creation of an index. However, they have the discretion on what they want to overweight, what they want to underweight, perhaps even ignore. At the end of the day, every holding rests with them. An index certainly has some judgment going into the creation of the rules up front, but once those rules are decided on, it is fully automated. There's no deviation at all. And if you think about that, in my view, there are two major implications of those differences. The first is that an index gives you a more predictable ESG footprint and exposure over time because it's sticking to those rules. And so if you want to understand the ESG profile versus some of the indexes that people see on TV and generally track as a barometer of market performance, the consistency is there. Similarly, from a performance and risk perspective. The second major implication is cost. Generally speaking, index-based investing is about a third to half the cost of active management. And so there's a certain element of value there for investors, for sure. Absolutely. Now, how does ESG awareness impact the risk of a portfolio? So that's a, that's a really good question. And I guess the way I would answer it is ESG awareness seeks to avoid bad outcomes. Mm. And if you translate that to a risk perspective, you would expect lower volatility over time. And let me maybe walk through a few examples. So I'm going to date myself for sure on this first one. But um, I am old enough to remember the Exxon Valdez oil spill 30 years ago. And 11 million barrels of crude oil spilled off the coast of Alaska, an absolute environmental disaster. And images clearly plastered all over the news. Now, what most people don't realize about that incident is that Exxon stock price only moved about 5%. And it pretty quickly recovered after they started making progress on the cleanup. Now, if you compare that to more modern day ESG disasters, there's a lot of research out there to indicate that companies are punished more quickly and more severely than they've ever been before. And so I guess there's a, a few high profile examples, right? Vale, the Brazilian mining company, had a dam collapse on them in 2019. Horrible outcome. Volkswagen and the emissions scandal, the um, Equifax privacy breach. In all of these incidents, the peak to trough stock move wasn't 5% like Exxon, but 25 to 30%. Wow. And it makes sense, right? If you think about the world we're living in with smartphones, social media, the ability for a company's worst moment to be plastered across the globe instantaneously, you can understand why the stocks would be punished. And so I guess to answer your question directly, when you think about ESG index construction, the normal Canada index has roughly 100 stocks in it, whether it's ours or a competitor's. The traditional Canada exposure ESG index has 50 stocks in it. And so if you can just avoid a handful of really bad outcomes when you cut it down from 100 to 50, the thought process is that you have lower risk in the end. Now, how does MSCI derive an ESG rating? I think that's probably what most people want to know. Yes. So the, the simple answer to that question is that it is a sub-industry centric relative rating. Mm -hmm. And I really want to emphasize the point relative because oftentimes I get the question from investors, how could energy company XYZ possibly have a good ESG rating. Mm -hmm. They mine fossil fuels, they have high carbon emissions, or I get the question, why doesn't Tesla have the best rating <laughs> possible? And so, again, emphasizing that point relative and sub-industry centric, the whole point of an ESG rating isn't to penalize or reward a company based on the industry that they're in, it's to compare like companies to one another. Mm -hmm. 
And so if you're an ESG investor and your goal is climate oriented or UN SDG alignment or eliminating companies in a particular industry, of course we have tools for you, but that's not the point of an ESG rating. So to dig a little bit deeper on exactly how we construct it, the first part of the process is sorting the 10,000 or so companies that we cover into their sub-industry. And so a sub-industry is part of the GIC standard. So if you hear a portfolio manager on television talking about the fact that BMO is a financial services company or Enbridge is an energy company, nine times out of 10, they're referring to GICs. It's by far the most popular sector classification standard in the world. And so you have 11 sectors at the top of it, about 25 industry groups, 60 industries, and 160 sub-industries. And so once we group by sub-industry, we then go about identifying what the key issues are that drive the ESG profile of each sub-industry. And using, again, the BMO Enbridge example, financial services is a trust business. You would expect a really high score for corporate governance. Energy puts a lot of stress on the environment, and so you would expect the E to be higher. But regardless of what those weights are, we pull from a bank of 37 key issues. Governance is always a minimum of 33% weight. We look at things like board pay, um, independence, accounting practices, et cetera. And so once we've sorted by sub-industry, once we have identified the key issues, for each sub-industry that we tweak once a year in consultation with our clients, we then go about doing the work of assigning ratings. And like most things in life, there are a couple of phenomenal above average companies. There are a handful of below average companies and a lot of clustering in the middle. Now, how is the MSCI ESG Leaders Index constructed specifically? So the ESG Leaders Index takes a few elements of our ESG research and ratings into its construction process. And may, maybe let me start by defining the choices that need to be made in an index. So I think everyone's familiar with the market cap index, right? It's simply some cutoff on the number of companies or the minimum liquidity weighted based on their size measured by market cap. The moment you deviate from that, what we at MSCI would call an investment thesis index, there are four major decisions that you need to make along the way. The first of those decisions is what market do you wanna cover? Are we talking about just Canadian large cap stocks, mid and large, small, mid and large, all of North America, you have to define the market. The second thing um, that we need to figure out is how do you eliminate or narrow down that initial market? And in the case of ESG leaders, there are a few ways that we do that. The first is based on business involvement screens. There are 10 different business activities that are not eligible for inclusion in the index. Things like tobacco, alcohol, firearms, thermal coal, mm -hmm. et cetera. The second source of elimination is what we call an MSCI controversy score a zero to 10 quantification of how much controversy a particular company is embroiled in. Zero is the worst, zeros, ones, and twos are eliminated. Mm. The third source of elimination is the minimum ESG rating, which for this particular index is a double B. It's a triple A to triple C scale. Once we've eliminated all of those securities from eligibility, step three is figuring out what the constraints of the investment thesis index are gonna be. In this case, the major constraint is sector neutrality. So Canada has a very high proportion of financial services and energy companies in any index. So the Canada ESG Leaders Index is gonna have the same exact weight in financial services and energy. And then the fourth decision that has to be made is the weighting scheme. Is it gonna be market cap weighted? some other methodology. In our case, once we achieve that sector neutrality, we then start just by including all of the triple A's in that particular sector, double A's, single A's go down until we have 50% market cap coverage. So at the end of the day, you get an index that is well balanced, that has 10 different business involvement exclusions, that has sector weights that are equal to the parent index. Mm 
Amazing. Uh, last question, and you, you kind of touched on this with that answer. What are the, the biggest benefits of the MSCI ESG leaders approach? So I, I think there's a few things. The first is that it's got a large ecosystem behind it. So not only are there BMO ETFs and other ETFs mm -hmm. linked to these indexes, but large pensions, foundations, and endowments use them as their policy benchmark. There's a derivatives ecosystem. They have multiple users. They're a standard in the industry. I think speaking more personally, I just kind of like the trade-off that they give you, right? Based on that methodology we just discussed, there's always a back and forth between ESG purity and how much you are willing to deviate from a market cap index. And I think this particular approach strikes a nice balance. You have about half as many holdings as the parent index, and you have a tracking error somewhere in the range of 2 to 3% a year, which I think is reasonable. Well, thank you so much, Paul, for that overview of ESG investing and, of course, the MSCI uh, ESG Leaders Index. Now, you can invest in an ETF that tracks this index with BMO. They actually have four different ETFs, ESGA, ESGY, ESGE, and ESGG. And they also have BMO's balanced ESG ETF, ZESG, which is a balanced asset allocation ETF that invests in a number of their ESG exposures. Now I want to turn over our discussion to Rosa so we can discuss the other side of the coin when it comes to responsible investing, and that's active ownership and engagement. So Rosa, let's start off with this question can you explain to us what active ownership and engagement is and what your team's approach is at GAM? Yeah, of course. And thanks so much for having me, first of all. Um, so there are a lot of different words that kind of mean the same thing. Uh, active ownership, uh, engagement, we call it also stewardship at BMO GAM. And it is essentially um, engaging with the companies in your portfolio, so the companies you own, uh, to create positive change. So that can be addressing ESG risks uh, and opportunities. Um, it can be trying to move certain companies in a more positive direction, um, addressing types of controversies that they've, they, they've had. Um, and under the umbrella of stewardship, you can see a company engagement uh, is one element, and that's really direct dialogue with companies. So sitting down with the board of directors or executives to discuss an ESG topic. Um, proxy voting is another element of this, and that is really using your right to vote um, at a company's annual shareholder meeting. So this can be anything from um, saying yes or no to the directors who are on the slate, or things like executive compensation, or also sometimes environmental and social issues. Um, so at BMO GAM, uh, we have uh, a strategy that is really based on three pillars. So the first pillar is uh, ESG risk, engagement on ESG risk. And that's really taking like the, the type of ESG data um, that MSCI provides and looking across our holdings to see what companies are really lagging on ESG performance and engaging with them to make sure that they can enhance that performance over time. Uh, because we all really want the company to do well, uh, you know, once we're invested in them. The second pillar is around our two key thematic areas, climate action and social equality. And those two thematic, thematic areas we've chosen really because um, they are not company specific, but they're really sector-wide, industry-wide, market-wide. Of course, as we know, climate change is one of the defining key issues of our time. Uh, and social equality, we think, is the second key issue of our time, really, um, and also necessary to be able to solve issues like climate change. And so um, the climate action and social equality pillar of our engagement program is focused on um, thematic projects. So it could be uh, a project engaging companies entirely on getting to net zero, um, so net zero emissions by 2050. Or it could be under the social equality umbrella, engaging companies on human rights or labor issues um, or indigenous reconciliation. And then the third pillar that we have uh, is called governance foundations. And it's a little bit more boring, I would say, but it is really to make sure that companies have that type of 
governance foundation necessary to be able to uh, perform as a good company. So transparency, accountability, making sure that there is responsibility at the top for ESG issues. And it really uh, is closely related to our proxy voting. Um, so there's a lot of engagements with companies before we uh, issue our vote at the shareholder meeting, uh, during that season, and then afterwards as well to make sure that we follow up with the companies to make sure that they you know, do what they had set out uh, to do. Now, when an investor invests in a BMO ETF, what can they expect from an active ownership perspective? That's a good question. And I think a lot of people might not know this, but um, really our engagement program covers all of BMO GAMS funds. So also the, the ETFs. Um, so they can expect uh, a full, full voting from us, active voting on, on all of the shares and the companies that are in those ETFs. Um, they can expect uh, engagement on ESG risks and opportunities, on climate action and social equality, as I explained um, earlier. But it also covers things like policy engagement, which is engagement with um, policymakers, governments, uh, standard setters. And this is really about um, making sure that the, the bar is set higher, the standards are set higher for an entire market or country. Um, so an example of that would be, we have been advocating in Canada for stronger modern slavery legislation. And that is actually asking for stronger rules for companies to disclose um, how they are ensuring that there are no uh, modern slavery risks in their portfolio or sorry, in their uh, operations and uh, disclosing that as well. So um, letting investors and just the general public know uh, that they have investigated, that they have measures in place to uh, ensure that there are no um, human rights or modern slavery risks uh, present in their operations. Um, and so everybody who invests in an ESG ETF or an ETF or any other fund uh, of BMO really benefits from that type of engagement uh, that we do both uh, around the indices as well as the companies uh, in the portfolios. Now, can you provide some examples of how you've made an impact when it comes to a company's approach regarding specific ESG issues? Yes, gladly. <laughs> um, I have two examples. One of them is on climate action and is around Suncor. Um, we probably all know this company quite well. They um, have been, uh, uh, we've been engaging Suncor for, I would say, uh, over a decade. Uh, but in the last few years, we've been engaging them as part of an investor collaboration that's called Climate Action 100 Plus. Mm -hmm. And we are one of the investor leads for this company. Um, basically, when we started out this engagement, uh, Suncor didn't really have firm commitments to reaching net zero by 2050 in place. And they did have climate strategies, but they weren't as well defined, at least not the way that we wanted them to be. So we worked with them for a number of years, um, and then we were happy to see them last year actually really uh, come out with a new climate strategy. It included things like um, electrification, uh, uh, hydrogen, uh, a plan for um, investment into lower carbon fuels. Um, they also came out with a commitment to reach net zero by 2050. And they also set some uh, absolute emissions targets for 2030. So a lot of change. Um, they really, really turned the ship around in a way. Um, and then we were also really happy that they had uh, tied some of these climate goals into executive compensation so that executives would be you know, rewarded or penalized for, for reaching those goals. Um, so that is one example. And then the other one that I wanted to touch on is Loblaw. Mm. Um, and it is around diversity, equity and inclusion, a big topic, of course, these days and very important. And I think we also really feel that having a lot of diversity at the top uh, can help manage ESG risks mm -hmm. and can also really help a company uh, take advantage of, of new opportunities. Um, so as part of a uh, sort of an investor collaboration, we uh, co-drafted a investor statement called the Canadian Investor Statement for Diversity and Inclusion. <laughs> and uh, it was signed by a whole number of investors in Canada, institutional investors. 
And so as part of our commitments that we made in that statement, um, we reached out to uh, a lot of companies uh, in the Canadian market to um, share our expectations with them that they would have um, you know, adequate representation of, of black and brown and indigenous people on the board, um, so underrepresented groups. Mm -hmm. So really going beyond gender rep representation on the board, because I think we've really moved the needle on that already in the last few years. Um, and Loblaw was one of the companies, uh, you know, that we had reached out to and engaged with. They were the first one to set an actual target for having visible minorities on the board by 2024. Uh, I think the target was around 25%, and they are already halfway there, so they're at 17% now. Um, and so we'll be, you know, keeping engaging with them to make sure that they reach their target, but uh, a really great example of, of setting leadership in that space. Absolutely. And my last question for you is, how is active ownership evolving and where do you see it in the future? Yeah, I think it's a really interesting space. Uh, it has evolved so much in the last 10 years that I've been in, involved with it. Um, it's gotten a lot more collaborative, I would say. So um, investors are now really banding together to address those big topics like climate change. So a investor initiative that I mentioned earlier, Climate Action 100 Plus, um, is now in a way being duplicated to just focus on the Canadian market, and that's called Climate Engagement Canada. So it's all Canadian investors engaging with Canadian companies to get them to net zero. And I think that's really great. Um, you know, some of the biggest investors are at the table um, and companies are generally receptive, you know, when when there's a, a lot of force behind, behind these initiatives. Um, but I also think there's going to be a little bit more focus on the human rights equation mm -hmm. of this. I think investors have rallied behind climate change really well. Uh, and now it's time to um, really look at human rights as a key critical issue. So the United Nations Principles for Responsible Investment, it's an investor network uh, where most of the investors who uh, are responsible investors uh, are members. They have just launched a new initiative called Advance, and it's really focused on human rights. Um, we're really pleased that we were are going to be able to lead some of the big Canadian uh, names in that um, for that engagement. So that would be us setting sort of the agenda and the focus for engaging on human rights uh, with Canadian companies. That's amazing. Well, thank you so much, Paul and Rosa, for those great insights. We appreciate you sharing your knowledge. Uh, and thanks to BMO ETFs for putting together this event on ETF Market Insights, giving DIY investors quality education around investing. And we hope you enjoyed this session. And thanks so much for watching.